we're going to talk about one area of applied psychology that's very near and dear to my heart, and that is educational psychology. Although I'm a developmental psychologist, I tend to study developmental topics that take place within educational contexts. And for instance, when we look at educational psychology, if we're looking at the classroom and the classroom climate, a lot of this can overlap with work culture and human factors, of course, but we're looking at how supportive a classroom climate is. Are people, are classrooms overcrowded? Are classrooms noisy and chaotic? Are they hostile? Is there lots of bullying? Or are classrooms very full of resources and people are quiet and they're well organized and everyone's supportive and friendly? That's dramatically going to change the learning outcomes for a student. Educational psychologists also have to look at things like the teacher-student relationships. Are, stu are teachers really more of that authoritarian theory X leader or are they more of the mentor theory Y leader? Are they going to be more supportive towards students? And even if a teacher is very open and mentoring, they often don't have the same relationship with all their students. That is, some students are just going to be more positive and close with the teacher, while other students are going to be more combative and antagonistic, and other students might be really quiet and distant, and others yet may be overly clingy and dependent on the teacher. So understanding how those teacher-student relationships can cause different educational outcomes is a major part of this work. But even more important than classroom climate and teacher-student relationships is student outcomes. And two major student outcomes we're interested in are student achievement, are they actually learning things, and student engagement. And engagement is really, do students pay attention? Do they participate? Are they motivated? Do they keep their mind on task? And do they even like school? And that is a major important thing. Even if a child's doing well on their tests, if they're not engaged, that's a major predictor that the school system has failed that student. So a lot of educational psychology goes into building a more positive classroom climate, building stronger teacher-child-student relationships so we can increase engagement and increase achievement in turn. So classroom climate, teacher-student relationships, engagement and achievement is something that both my master's, my PhD and my postdoc have focused on and it's the area that I'm pretty excited about. But aside from that, educational psychology can be so much more. It can be things like understanding how to implement policies in school, whether it was the zero tolerance aggression policy, or whether it's dress code policies, or whether it's anti-bullying policies, how that impacts the students and how that impacts the school climate and the school culture is really important. We also know things like health management. Is there going to be vending machines in school? Is there going to be bottled water or water fountain in school? What type of cafeteria, if there's a cafeteria, or do students package things from home? These health management programs are essential to understanding how kids develop and thrive in the school system. We also know things like, is there sports activities? Is there a field? Is the playground just a concrete parking lot? Or is the playground actually grass with nets so they can do something? and how would that impact the students and how would it impact their engagement at school. Educational psychology also looks at assessing special needs, whether that's gifted and talented or learning disabilities or students on the autism spectrum, students with conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder. We'll talk about some of those in our next unit, but understanding if there is any exceptional learners in the school and how to best address their needs. And that may include students that are deaf, hard of hearing, blind, or have speech language issues that they need help with, such as students that are English second language or who have problems with pronunciation. So a lot of educational psychology overlaps with other care professionals. And finally, this can also take on providing some therapy, providing some counseling in the forms of guidance counseling. And that could be both listening to bullying and listening to social emotional problems, such as if a child's going through divorce, or it can be career mentoring and helping the students to apply for university. So educational psychology is really diverse and a really big area of study. Now our last area of applied psychology that we're going to talk about in this unit, but not the last to exist, is sports psychology. So sports psychology has a couple different flavors. One of them is the overlap with psychology, neuroscience, and kinesiology. And this is the idea of understanding how our bodies work understanding how our joints and our muscles and our nerves and how they can fire and understanding what can lead to the best physical training. So understanding the science of body movements and posture and proration when you run and things like that can really help to counsel an athlete and a professional athlete to perform better at their sport. 
This area of sports psychology can also help to advise how to keep one's body in top training shape through advising about nutrition and sleep schedules and things like retaining the right level of bodily fluids and all that sort of things can help prime us physically for the game. But sports psychology is not just about physical training. A big part of sports psychology is about psychological training. And this is really the study of the motivation, confidence, and performance of athletes. This is the idea that sports are very mental. If you think about something like running a marathon, what gets a lot of people out of the race is not that they physically fall down, but that they mentally hit a wall at some point during that marathon. And a lot of us, when we're performing sports, we begin to feel like we can't do it or we're fatigued or we're about to have an accident before we actually do. And it's that mental focus. And so a lot of sports psychology is helping us to get at that peak level. We've talked about in a few units now that peak level of optimal performance where you're not too stressed, but you're not too sleepy. Getting an athlete right to that level and feeling confident and feeling like they can reach their peak performance is a lot of a sports psychologist task. Helping to rev them right up, but not allowing them to become overwhelmed. So teaching them some relaxation tricks or how to breathe and get into the zone so they don't become too stressed, but how to get pumped up so they're not under stressed or under aroused is really essential. We can see this in things like if we're going to go golfing and if somebody's going to videotape us taking a swing, how much more anxious that can make you if the camera's on or off. And so a sports psychologist would help provide some tricks and provide some counseling so we can get over our camera shyness. Or the idea that if you are a professional sports team and you're trying to get into the playoffs, you know, sometimes you get really beat down, you get really exhausted after a lose, and the sports psychologist is there to rev you back up, get you in the zone so you can perform optimally. It can also help counsel things when it comes to team dynamics or locker room behavior, it can help deal with anxiety, and it can also give you some other guides and advice that can help you through training, such as pairing music to your preparation or other types of lifetime skills. I've been fortunate enough to know two sports psychologists, uh, Dr. Ryan Hamilton and Dr. Adam Kingsbury, and I've enjoyed watching their professional endeavors, whether that's traveling with the Tampa Bay Lightning or going with the Canadian Women's Curling Olympics team. And so seeing them excel as sports psychologists has been really cool. So the big takeaway I want you to have from this unit is that psychology is something that can exist outside the research lab, outside the clinician's office, outside the university setting, and it's something that psychology can help us with in so many different avenues of our life. Whether that's how we go grocery shopping or how we deal with our coworkers, how we perform in our sports league on the weekend, how we handle the feedback we get from our child's school and child's principal, or how we engage with nature. Psychology is everywhere and all around us.